Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen wa usalli wa usallam ala nabiyyana Muhammad wa ala alihi wa ashabihi ajma'in Lessons are blessings Lessons are blessings and out of all the lessons that I've learned in my life and soon inshallah ta'ala Coming September, Bismillah Taala, I'll be 50 years old, probably 50 already according to the Islamic calendar, which is half of a century. And it is no mystery, ya khwan, ya akhwat, that there's always something new to learn, always something to get a deeper reflection and a deeper understanding. Uh, and I can think of all the lessons that my father taught me while we were driving in the car or were outside from either taking out the garbage, or cleaning up the washroom, or cleaning up my room, or picking up the twigs, or shoveling, or any of the things, all those lessons, even though when I was young, I hated them, now they're a great, tremendous blessings. The wisdom that my father had given me those lessons, as well as my mom, some of them now, ya ikhwan, ya akhwat, they're giving me great benefit up until today. So, as you know, as life goes by, and within the last year, people are now starting to think for once in their lifetime. Because the hustle and bustle of the dunya, everybody's been at home, and after you get tired of watching YouTube, Twitter, uh, TikTok, Netflix, NBA, whatever other shows that are there, for those that aren't reading or not, they don't like to read, after a while, there comes a time where people, they start to get some thoughts in their brain. They start thinking. The brain actually turns on. Because we're in a time now that we have been bombarded by a lot of crazy propaganda that is messing with a lot of people's mind. And, yeah, when the subliminal messages are on a whole nother level. Now, I grew up in a time where we would take an old record, an old record, and spin the record backwards because we were told that the hip hop artists or the R&B artists or the pop artists, they'd have a hidden message in the song when you put the record backwards, there's some sort of a hidden message there. Some good, some bad. Some of the hidden messages your subconscious mind would pick up. And this is one of the things here with advertising and marketing. Sometimes some things go right in front of us and unless somebody who's skilled enough or they know the industry they point it out to you, you, it would go right past your head. You wouldn't even pick it up. So the lessons are the blessings, Ya Khwan. And one of, my, one of the lessons my father taught me, thank you, Jazakallah Khair Sheikh, he said that there's no fool, there is no fool like an old fool. And there's no old fool, there's no, there's no fool that, there's no old fool who is a fool who's worse than one who even didn't go to school. So, if you think about it for a minute, an old fool who is a fool and he never went to school, that means he's not developed, he doesn't have no skill sets, he has no culture, he has no, he has no upbringing, he has no mentoring, he has no tarbiyah. And we're living in a time right now that, and I was just talking to some brothers all day long, and the amount of things that I'm hearing, I've heard four divorce parties, of sisters happy that they got their khula this month. Four different, four different people told me that this has been happening in this month. Okay? Then I'm hearing about the amount of Muslim kids that are in the jail. And ya khwan, there has to be a topic that I come one day and I just talk about how ignorance, how ignorance, how ignorance will lead our community into incarceration jail time so the lessons and the blessings that my father taught me he used to tell me son be careful who you hang out with be careful who you spend your time with be careful of the people that are whispering in your ear and he used to say to me you're hanging out with your friends in the street do they feed you no i feed you do they clothe you no i clothe you do they put a shelter over your head no i do that so he said your friends will come and go, but I hope you understand these lessons. And he used to tell me that when I was a young man. And 
being a young man, sometimes we don't have time to listen to our parents. Sometimes we don't have time to hear what they got to say because they're old and they don't know nothing. They're not with the times, man. But guess what? Your parent will always be your parent. You can divorce all your friends. You can divorce all your bosses. You can divorce even your children. But your parents will always be your children. So the lessons are blessings, brothers and sisters. And inshallah ta'ala, there's a few points that I collected out of a couple of books. And I brought some other books here too. As you know, we're coming down to the wire. Coming down to the end here. And there's just so many great lessons that I've learned this month. Trying to cram in as much Quran as I can. Trying to listen to lectures. Trying to talk to brothers. Trying to get advice and give advice. It comes a time where you got to sit and you got to look at the lessons as the blessings. The great blessings that we have, the lessons. So one of the sheikhs, he wrote down that lesson, it is a period of teaching and learning. So you may actually learn the lesson, but you don't really own that lesson until you teach it on to somebody else. And as I'm sitting and I'm looking at I have a nephew, I have a son, I have a niece, I have daughters, I have cousins. And I try to talk to them, some of them they take it, some of them they don't take it. But maybe one day if I plant the seed, maybe one day it'll germinate and there'll be some beautiful as they say, you reap what you sow, some beautiful stock. So a lesson or a class is a structured period of time where learning is intended to occur. So how many times have we heard of Muslim kids, ah, it's boring, ah, I don't want to listen, it's boring, I don't want to go to the masjid, the people there are boring, what am I going to learn? And the problem is, is that everything has become a lecture. Before I even get into the meat and potatoes, I was trying to say to some brothers at another masjid out in Scarborough, and I told them, why don't you just remove the name called lecture and call it Youth Empowerment Workshop? They said, why would we do that? And I said, watch this. So there were some kids walking by, and I said, come, 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 some random kids, I never met them. And I said to the kid, I said, brother, come here, come here. When's the last time that you heard a lecture? You want to come to a lecture? The kid's like, no, I don't want to come to the lecture. He said, why? He goes, I don't like lectures. He said, why? He goes, my mother, she lectures me every day. I don't I hate lectures. And at that time, those brothers at that masjid, they seen the wisdom I was trying to tell them that a lecture means that your parents are going to rant and complain to you. So now if you come to the masjid, come to the lecture. Then the imam, he's going to yell at the people. So we don't want that. So... A structured period of time where learning is intended to occur. But the question is, we have all these beautiful masajid and the jails are packed with Muslims. Packed with Muslims. As I just got another report just before, the amount of Muslims that are in the jail. So my dear brothers, my dear sisters, a blessing is God's favor and it is a protection. So sometimes the barakah that we hope that we're going to have there's something called naqis bitun al baraka. Something is sufficient of blessings because of the sins and the problems that we have ourselves incurred. And we find that this month of Ramadan, ya akhwan, ya akhwan, oh you who knew Ramadan, did you know who your Lord was? Did you know the Quran? Did you know fasting? Did you know zakat? Did you know sadaqah? Did you know the five prayers? Did you know the masjid? Absolutely not, not this month. Did you know the acts of doing good? People are doing online sadaqah, that's been made easy for us. Will you know Allah after Ramadan? Verily, Yahwan, the Lord of the 11 months is the same Lord of the month of Ramadan. And the Lord of Ramadan, He is the same Lord of Shawal and Sha'aban and all the rest of the months. So if you worshipped the Lord of Ramadan only in Ramadan, then you have a problem. I have a problem. We have a problem. Allah Ta'ala went on to say, وَعَبُدْ رَبَّكَ حَتَّى يَأْتِكَ الْيَكِينَ And worship your Lord until there comes the time of certainty. And 
The majority of the scholars say that this means when death approaches you. When Malik al Mawt comes, then there's no, there's la shak fi dalik, there's no doubt that the soul will be taken away. So Allah Ta'ala is saying, worship your Lord until certainty comes, meaning your whole life. There's no time to take off, ya ikhwan, ya akhwan. Many Muslims, I've heard them already say, I can't wait to go on a vacation after Ramadan. And sure, we might need some vacation on Utla. I wish I can go and visit some of my friends. I wish I can go and take my mom to go visit some of her friends. I wish I can travel to Mecca and Medina. Of course, there's nothing wrong with that. But ya ikhwan, when we're only thinking about the things that will take us away from Allah, and we're not planning with our trip, well, yes, I will take my mom to go see her friends. And as I drop her off with her friends, there's also a masjid around the corner. I'll go and I'll establish my salat. Plus, a brother that I used to be close to, he lives in that city. Maybe I can go and meet the brother for the sake of Allah. As a seven, when there's no shade, is to go and meet a brother for the sake of Allah. So we have to know our religion good enough that we can get multiple blessings based upon our attention, Ya There's nothing wrong with that. So we find Allah Ta'ala wanted to say, Kul inna salati wa nusaki wa mahiyaya wa mamati lillahi rabbil alameen. Say, my prayer and my sacrificing of the animal, my living and my dying are all for Allah, the Lord of all the worlds. So our prayer is an act of ibadah, and the sacrificing of the animals to feed the people, that's an act of ibadah. But your whole life from the beginning to the end is also supposed to be an act of ibadah. So even if you make the intention while you're going to sleep so you can get strong enough and you're able to get recuperated and replenished so you can get up and worship Allah and provide for your family, this can also be an act of worship, ya ikhwan, ya akhwan. The Shaykh, he also made some other great, great points and then he asked some questions and he went on to say, question, is our will, our condition, Will it be the same after Ramadan? Right now, the iman that we're feeling, the good feelings of reading the Quran. MashaAllah, some people they reach, they finish the whole Quran. Some they finish a quarter of the Quran. Some finish the half of the Quran. Some, MashaAllah, they learn one surah. I, someone asked me the other day, brother, what surah are you on? I said, I'm still on Fatiha. I'm still trying to understand it. As many Muslims, they don't really understand Fatima. The question comes after Ramadan. The Shaykh said, Will we be lazy after Ramadan? Some Muslims, they don't never fast the six days after the shawal, or they don't fast other days. Will we be reckless and negligent after Ramadan? Will we jump back on the train of misguidance right after Ramadan? And I can remember, and remember, I grew up here in the West, I understand it. I don't agree with it, but I understand it. I can remember the Muslims when the new Batman movie came out, the Muslims packed up Batman, more than the non-Muslims when the Batman came out. It came out four, four, four or five days before. It was packed with non-Muslims. Soon as the Eid finished, the Muslims were there. Okay, mashallah, you need a little bit of entertainment. You want to take the kids out the house. Okay. Are we jumping back on the road to misguidance? The next one is, will we fall back into the forbidden things? This is a question all of us, we need to ponder. These are some great insights of the Sheikh. The Sheikh goes on to say, did we seize the opportunities in this blessed season of obedience? In this blessed season of obedience. Did we ask for forgiveness? And alhamdulillah, I taught my family, Allahumma aghfirli, warhamni, wahdani, wa'afani, warzuqani. It's a beautiful, powerful dua. Also, the shaykh goes on to say, or did we just waste our time? Are we winning? And then are we going to be sinning with our grinning? As some of the Muslims are saying, man, I can't wait to go back out there. I can't wait. I'm in shackles. So here's the thing. The devils have been shackled this month from the shayateen, even though we know that they're shayateen from the men and the ins that are out there. And now the Muslims are shackled from not doing haram in this month, and they can't wait to get their shackles to go and to start doing some haram. This is really a, a serious insight of the sheikh. Did we really complete? Did we really compete to do good deeds? As Allah says, "Fastabiku khairat." Did we race with our brothers to see? Mashallah, brother, I heard you donated five hundred. I'm going to donate six hundred. Did we race? Did we try to do that? So the Lord of Ramadan is the Lord of the other eleven months, Yahwan. He kept emphasizing this, 
And this is something that we have to really look at, Ya Ikhwan, that what is time? What is time? It's your lifespan, the Sheikh said. It's your strength, it's your youth, it's your intellect, it's your thought, it's your heart, it's your tongue, and all other, and all other parts of your limbs. This is your life, this is your time. What are you doing with it? This is a question he's asking us to ponder. What are we doing with our life? The Sheikh goes on to say, have we wronged our souls? And then he quoted the ayah, Anta waliyun fil dunya wal akhira tawaffani musliman wa hiqani bisaliheen. You are my protector in this world and in the hereafter. And you cause me to die as a Muslim and join me with the righteous. This is a dua, Ya Khwan. You are my protector, Allah, in this world and in the hereafter. And we're going to need Allah's protection, Ya Khwan, more in the hereafter than we need it here. Why? Here, you might end up in jail, you might get killed. You might get murdered, you might die, get in a car accident, okay. Full stop, you get buried. Okay, once you get buried, then you're gonna be asked those questions. Who's your Lord? Who's your religion? Who's your prophet? Okay, good. Now comes the day of judgment. You have a whole bunch of questions you gotta be asked. Just you and Rabbul Isa. You're gonna be asked all kinds of questions. It's a very scary thing if you think about it. Then there's retribution for the evil that you did. There's punishment, something called the hellfire. Many Muslims, they don't even think about it. Sometimes the Muslims are going through hell on earth, and we can see our brothers suffering all over the world. And I, have, I can see it, but I've never lived it. I can hear about it, people can tell me about it, but until you live going through a serious struggle, you should be happy that those things that have afflicted our brothers haven't afflicted us. We should be thankful. We should pray for them, ask Allah to help them. But we got to sit and evaluate what's going on all over the world, Ya Akhwan. I know Muslims suffering right down the road. I know Muslims suffering. I know Muslims suffering in Toronto. I know Muslims suffering in Alberta. I know Muslims suffering in Detroit. I know Muslims suffering in Philadelphia and in California. I'm connected. I have people all over the world that contact me. I know a brother is over in Indonesia right now. He's helping some orphans over there. So people are suffering all over the world. Are we suffering like they're suffering? We may have some problems in our family that nobody knows about. I was just discussing with the brother about one imam that he went to uh, one of the jails and one of the kids that was in the jail, he prays beside his uncle and his father every morning and they've never said to anybody that their kid is in jail. But the brother knows the name of the family and he knows the kid. And the kid is half of the Quran. So this is a great musibah. The family doesn't even want to talk about it. The kid is in jail. And it's not just doing drugs and marijuana. This is one of the things that Muslims think that that's all that it is. As we know now, marijuana is halal in the country of Canada. Not with Allah, but it's halal in this country now. And now the Muslims, that was the thing that everybody was the taboo, but now the next level, the next level, the next level of evil is upon the kids. So one of the brothers, he was saying, brother, this is horrible. That the Muslims are falling into this. And then I showed him a paper, the Muslims doing fentanyl and cocaine and heroin and all the kind of drugs, and he was shocked. And then he read the names. And then we told him, half these kids are half of the Quran. He's like, this is horrible. I said, nobody gets worse than this. He goes, how can it get worse than that? I said, I, I know of Muslim kids that are breaking and entering into people's houses, you know, beating up people, robbing, stealing, taking their jewelry. He goes, oh, this is really bad. I said, no, it's worse than that. He said, how can it be worse than that? I said, well, I just got a call from an imam, and he told me that his nephew, he just left Islam. Ilhad. Muslim kids are leaving Islam. There's a lot of doubt. There's a lot of people teaching that used to be popular years ago, that people respected them. They're now teaching the children the wrong things about the religion. And because at one time they had a big popular, you know, people used to listen to them, you have to be careful who we're taking our religion from, and what sources that they're taking. And do the other scholars or people of knowledge say what they're saying? And this is one of the things, you know, at a, as a, at a young age, as a young Muslim, you know, some of my teachers, you know, some of them are still living and some of them passed away. I can remember the first Arabic sentence that I ever learned 
One of my sheikhs, some brothers were saying something that was wrong. And the sheikh looked at them and he said, Man, aina laka hadha, brother. Man, aina laka hadha. Where do you get this from? Do you have dalil? Do you have evidence? Do you have proofs? And who of the scholars say what you're saying? Min aina laka hadha. Where do you get this from? And this is a time right now, it's really critical. That we have to be really, really careful. Because people are buying and selling their religion left, right, and center. There's a very famous story, it's known in England, where some Muslim women from a Muslim country, they left their Muslim country and they came to England, and they were working in a grocery store, and they were really upset, and one of the women, she was like, <sighs> and the Muslim girl that was in the niqab, she said to her, what's the problem? She said, I left my country to get away from Islam and the Muslims. And the sister, she picked up her niqab like this, blue-eyed and blonde hair, recent convert. She said, well, that's good. You left your religion, you sold your religion, we bought it. وَإِن تَتَوَلَّوْا يَسْتَبْدِلْ قَوْمٍ غَيْرَكُمْ ثُمَّ لَا يَكُونُوا أَمْثَالَكُمْ If you turn your back on the religion of Allah, that's okay. Allah, He will replace me and you, if we don't want to keep our upkeep upon spreading Islam and teaching Islam. We we're just closing down uh, the windows here, so that's good. Jazakallah khair. So when we sit and we look at it, brothers and sisters, there has been some information that has come down to us by one of the greatest Muslims that ever lived. He was the Prophet Wasallam's cousin, and he was very gifted and very knowledgeable. And he left us with a long call, a long statement. Inshallah ta'ala, I'm going to do my best to try to read it. And if the Shaykh, if he feels that I need to be corrected, for al mashkur al Ali ibn Abi Talib, he went on to say, Irtahalat al-dunya mudbiratan. Wa irtahalat al-akhira muqbilatan. Wa li kulli wahidatin. One narration I read online, it said, Minha, and the other one said, Minhuma. So there's two different loves that I found. Banuna fakuna min abna al akhira wala takuna min abna al dunya. Fa in al yom amalun wala hisab wa ghadan hisabun wala amal. So Ali ibn Talabi went on to say The world, the dunya, the world, the material world that we're living in is departing. And the hereafter, meaning the paradise, it's approaching. And each of them have their offspring or their children. So be from the children of the hereafter and do not be from the children of the world, meaning that your only concern is the worldly life. And our religion teaches us to be balanced. Rabbana atina fi dunya hasnatan wa fi akhirati hasnatan wa qina adabana. As we said before, that Allah give us the good in this life and the good in the hereafter. And he went on to say, verily today, there are actions and no reckoning. It means people are doing whatever they want to do. Robbing, stealing, cheating, going to this party, going to that party, doing all types of horrible things as we see it on TV every day. But I want to say, but tomorrow there is reckoning and no action. When you're on your grave, when you're dead, you can't do no more good deeds. And as we know, the Apostle said that only three things will benefit the people after that they're dead is number one, a sadaqal jariyah, which is a long-lasting charity that you can get all the rewards and the benefits from after you're dead, such as building a masjid like this masjid, or building a madrasa like some of the madrasas, or building a well, or buying some books where people can read it, education, he said, or some knowledge that you left behind when you die. Imam al-Turmidhi has been holding me up here. This is where my phone is right here. I have three volumes of Imam al-Turmidhi that's been holding me up all month. Even the brothers, they come, they set up, they know that's, those are the three books. Imam al-Turmidhi, his books, has got lots of benefit, lots of knowledge, and it's holding up my lecture right now. And he's held us up, teaching us the sunnah. So this is, ya ikhwan, a sarka jariya, on many levels, he's getting so much reward. Then you have, ya ikhwan, a righteous son or a righteous daughter that will make dua for you after you die. After you die and you're buried, will your children be righteous? Will they practice the religion? Will they be half as good as their father or a quarter of their father? Will they leave a legacy after you die? As we see here 
I was just explaining to some of the brothers here that this masjid here, we see this masjid that we're in right now, and we see what's coming, inshallah ta'ala, the big hole there, that inshallah one day a beautiful masjid will come. But if you were slept on it, you don't know the history, behind me, the brothers that are putting together this masjid, they were influenced by someone who is not here, may Allah have mercy upon Ammu, who started this project years ago, there's a little small masjid behind. So that was his legacy, and he encouraged his son, and his son is carrying on, and hopefully, inshallah ta'ala, those that come after, and this is how it's supposed to be, brothers and sisters. I want my son and my daughter to be better than me in everything. I want them to learn from my mistakes, and I want them to get the keys of happiness in this dunya. So I also brought with me today a few chapters of Sayyid al-Khatir, the captured thoughts, as we've been just taking a few little bites of this book over this month. And it's been so beautiful. And I wanted to share with the brothers, and the, the bad thing that I did not do is I did not bring my glasses, so I'm hoping I can see it. So the Shaykh, he went on to say, and I thought that this would be some beautiful advice for us all. He went on to say, devoting oneself to Allah. Devoting, giving your life for Allah in terms of you're at the servitude of trying to be a good person, a good citizen. The Shaykh, he went on to say, in the early years of my life, I was inspired and guided to follow the way of those who practice zuhud, meaning that you're not trying to get too much of the worldly life, by consistently fasting and praying. Sawm was salat, or salat was sawm. I was fond of secluding khalwa, myself, from everyone to worship Allah. So he would basically stay away from the people and focus more on his ibadah. Remember, this book was written 900 years ago. Okay? During my solitude, I enjoyed having a good kind heart, a qalb. And my insight was strengthened. And I grieved over every moment I did not spend in getting close to God through my worship and my obedience. Being a person who is a muttaqeen, he's really scared of God. This encouraged me to take advantage of every moment to perform good deeds and acts of worship while enjoying the intimacy uh, with my Lord in seclusion, khalwa. And my Lord and the sweetness, the halawa I have tasted while invoking Him in privacy. That He got to such a level of tranquility and seclusion that He tasted the love of being a pure worshiper of, of Allah, God the Almighty. That this is the thing that really made his heart go. This is the thing that gave him life. It refreshed him, it cleansed him. You know, him being able to worship God and being devout. So he went on to say, then persons, then persons in a position of authority liked my preaching. So somebody from the government, they liked his words, my preaching, and so they drew me close to them. They said, come, come over here, come close to us, man. Let's be friends. Come work for us, come give a lecture. This changed my nature. And so I lost the taste of such a sweetness. So at one time, he reached the level of aestheticism, zuhud, that he was so close. But then later on, he was given some reminders, trying to advise the people about the day of judgment and getting close to a lot and death. And some people, they liked his words. They said, come close, come close. Let's be together, let's work together. So then you say that once he did that, the taste of him just being a worshiper, it kind of diminished. So he went on to say, another such person of authority wanted to draw me close to him, but I abstained from consorting with him and I refused to eat from his food. That means he doesn't want to be wined and dined. He doesn't want to be bought off. You know, and as they say, there's no free lunch. You know, people will come to you and say, man, hey, man, let me, let me buy you lunch. Why? You want to pick my brain? You want some information? So even back then, there's no free lunches. So food, because of the doubtfulness of what he, was, what he offered. So this was the thing. Let me fatten you up for the slaughter, as they say in our language. Let me try to wine you and dine you, and then I'm going to come over here and I'm going to give you an offer. So this is what he's saying back 900 years ago. That's what I'm saying. Like when I'm rocking with the shake. The shaykh is timely. You can take his life and put it right to our life. Nothing's changed, Yahwan. Just the game is more fierce now. So the shaykh, he went on to say, Therefore, or thereafter, I became inclined towards 
interpreting the situations I experience and the things that happen to me in a convenient manner. To gain some ease, I began to indulge in enjoying what is lawful. So, he started to enjoy what is lawful. You get accustomed to the good life. And today our scent is Ud Musk by Narcisco Rodriguez. So you get accustomed to the good life, which is permissible. It's not haram. But now, if I get too attached to this, and someone gives me an oil that doesn't taste good, I'm going to be like, oh, I don't want that oil. You see, so this is the thing the Sheikh is saying, is that I began to indulge in enjoying what was lawful. Not haram, but what's permissible. This made me lose my tranquility and my sakina in my insightfulness, my uh, istinara, that's insightfulness. Therefore, consorting people brought forth darkness, dhulma, into my heart until the light, the nur I found in my heart had completely vanished. So, at one time he was an aesthetic, he was an abd, he was a worshiper, he was a person trying to get close to Allah. Then he started doing too much mixing, hanging with the people. And it had an effect upon him. And if we look at the example in the life of the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the Prophet ﷺ disliked heavily the culture and Mecca and all the stuff that was going on in Mecca, the idol worship and the lewdness and all types of stuff that he used to take himself up on the mountain and seclude himself away so he could think and he could um, reflect and he could meditate about the situation. It's such a heavy thing. So we see, Ya Khwan, that there's people that are on this level that they're thinking, man, I'm moving in too many circles, man. I, I need to, I don't feel right. I don't feel right. And I get like that sometimes too, where, you know, you may see me, I'm a very social butterfly, but then there'll be a time where I just go missing for a while. You need what they call hiatus and sabbatical. You need to do that from time to time. So the Shaykh goes on to say, Therefore, consorting people brought forth darkness, though, into my heart. And to the light, the nor I found in my heart had completely vanished. Since then, I could not conceal the yearning I had to return to what I had lost during the sermons I delivered, which were affectional enough to change the people who attended my sittings. So he had an effect upon the people, mashallah. This made people repent and rectify their affairs. So mashallah, the shaykh's talking about the fruits of his dawah. All the while pitying, all the while pitying for losing what I had lost myself. So by him mixing with the people, the people benefited, but he lost his benefit. So this shows you here, Yahwan. There comes a time when you lend the helping hand. There comes a time when you go the extra yard to help your brother and your sister, but then there has to come a time where you're like, hey, miss, hey, listen, man, you know, I'm going through some stuff right now too. I got some debt right now too. I'm going, I got some health problems right too. Let me take care of myself first, as Allah says, ku anfusikum, and then he says, your family wa ahlikum nara. So I got to save myself first, then my family, and some scholars, they have some difference of opinion, meaning it's from the qurba, the, 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 the closest to you or the whole ummah, ya khwan, we're all supposed to be brothers and sisters. There's some discussion on that. But the first thing, I got to save myself. Just like when you're in the airplane and they say that if the plane gets some turbulence or something wrong, they tell you, put on your mask first with the air, get yourself straight first before you help your neighbor. So I got to save myself first, ya khwan. The sheikh, has to save himself first. You know, so this is something for us to reflect upon. But the Shaykh, he went on to say, The whining of my distress troubled my heart. It increased, and I failed to treat myself or recover from such a condition. He failed to recover from that. Hence, I sought my comfort in visiting the graves. This is a lesson right here. Many of the great scholars, some of the best lectures if you read that they ever gave in front of 10,000, 20,000, 100,000 people is when they reminded the people about Kullu nafsin al maut. They gave lectures about death. The Sheikh is saying that what remedied his situation was when he went to go visit the grave. Going to the graveyard, it's one of the last sunnahs of the Prophet 
to go to the grave and look at the condition and see all the tombstones. And I've been to many graveyards here in Canada. I've been to many graveyards here in the United States of America. But there's nothing that I've seen. Two different things. It, it blew my mind away. I was in England and then a brother, he took me to a graveyard there. He took me up and we looked down and I seen graveyards going as far as the eye could see. And some of those, some of those graves were more than a thousand years old with old tombstones. That's one thing when I seen it over this big wall. So uh, this is the city here where the people live. And then on the other side of the wall is where all the dead are buried. That's number one. Number two is when I was in Egypt, I went to Medina Tal Mot. I went to the old city. And this blew my mind. This is 20 years ago. Me and some brothers, we we're going to see one of the sheikhs. And a brother said, okay, we have about 45 minutes before the masjid's only another two kilometers up the road. We can catch another taxi. I want to show you something. So we got out. And there was a city called Medina Tamot, where people were so poor that they lived, they made these little make, makeshift houses, little small out of cardboards and, and uh, bricks and whatever they could find, and they were living on top of the graveyard. I've seen it with my own eyes. Never seen anything like that ever before in my eyes. And, you, and at that age, I was only about 28, 29 years old. I seen it, it didn't really have that much of an effect on me. I was like, oh, that's deep. Now that I'm sitting and I'm thinking about it, that these people are living on top of where people are dead and buried. So the Sheikh is going on to say here, that hence I sought my comfort in visiting the graves of the pious. And I asked from Allah the grace of rectifying my affairs upon which the kindness of my Lord pulled me toward the sphere of khalwa, of solitude, despite the resistance of myself. So his own self saying, it's okay to go and eat a nice meal and a steak and this and that and hang out with these people, the hustlers and the bustlers. His soul, his nafs, it's nice, it's not haram. It's not haram. It's not haram. This is not haram. That's not haram. It's permissible. But his soul is not feeling something's wrong with his soul. So he goes on to say, Only then was my heart restored after being detached from me. And so I was shown the defects of what I had previously favored in this life. I woke up from the sickness of inadver in inadvertency. Yeah, I'm struggling here. I don't got my glasses. And... I uttered the following words while I was invoking the Lord during the time of my solitude. Oh my master, how can I thank how can I thank you enough? Oh my master, how can I thank you enough? And what laudatory words can my tongue utter to praise Mahd you enough? Can you come up with the eloquency, the nice beautiful words that he can really talk to his Lord? For I truly and deeply thank you, Shukr, you for absolving my heedlessness, my ghafla, awakening me from my sleep and rectifying my affairs through my desirous, my desirous self, disliked in it. Indeed, what has been taken away from me brought me nothing but gain since it was the reason because of which I turned to you. Indeed, what I have saved is tremendous since the outcome of what my heart of what my heart was apt to be. The Sheikh he goes on to say let me go back here. Um, my heart was apt to be in solitude with you. Indeed how affluent I am when you made me in need of you. Meaning he's successful, he's doing good when he's getting the blessings from Allah that he needs. How you indeed, how available I am when you dishearten me from being with the others. That Yahwan, he's talking about something which is so important, brothers and sisters. One of my sheikhs, he passed away, he used to drill this all the time. And I went and I studied with some sheikhs, and he used to drill this all the time. The topic of al-ma'iyyah, the companionship of Allah. 
the ma'iya of Allah Yahwan. This is something that he's, he's hoping to be. The Quran and the Sunnah is filled with all kinds of ayahs talking about the ma'iya, the companionship of Allah. You dishearten me from being with others. He went on to say, Oh Lord, I regret every moment I've not spent in your service. I have remorse from the time I spent in matters other than your obedience. For example, I used to wake up for Fajr without being distressed for sleeping all night long, not having awoken to pray, meaning to Hajjud. And I used to witness the commencement of the night without having any concern for knowing the day had passed. He didn't care what happened the day before. He just wants to worship Allah. Not regretting the moments I did not spend in your worship. As I did not realize the reason for not having any such feelings was because of the severity of the illness of my heart. Yahwan, he is looking at his heart as if it's something that's dying, Yahwan. Many of us, do we even have a heart? Is a heart in it? Are our hearts diseased? Do we have the amrad al khulub? Do we have a ran on our khulub, some rust spots? As a heart damage. And you, Akhwan, if you compare his ibadah to our ibadah, we would sit there and say, man, we don't have any ibadah. And he's saying that at one time he felt that, you know, his heart is having a hard time. So he goes on to say, I did not realize the reason for not having any such feelings was because of the severity of the illness of my heart. Now, however, after the arrival of the winds of a healthy change, I've managed to sense the pain through which I was directed in my healthiness, Yahweh. He's given us metaphors, but he's also saying that the status, the state of his heart, and the tranquility of worshiping and being a servant, Yahweh, that's the only thing that matters to him. Everything else, yeah, you can take a little bit of it, but it doesn't really give him the solace doesn't give the tranquility, the rida and the qana'a, the contentment of the heart. He goes on to say, O oh, you whose grace is tremendous, I beseech you to maintain and perfect my safety and my healthiness. And he has the strength and the vigor to worship Allah. What an intoxication whose roistering is unnoticed until after becoming unconscious or becoming conscious. I have torn apart what is difficult to amend. Hence, regretting the merchandise, the good deeds I have lost. My example is like a sailor who struggled with the northern troubled waves for some time. Then he was overpowered by the sleepiness. So when he awoke, he found himself back at his first starting location. This is jam-packed with beautiful lessons, Yahweh. He is talking about Yahwan Ghafla. His sleepliness. He is also talking about Yahwan the Barakah, the Allah gave him. He's also talking about Yahwan the Qana'a. And he's also talking about the topsy turvy way of the midmar of the battlefield of life that we're living in, Yahwan. The words that he wrote, Yahwan, when you read them and you think and you ponder, he's talking on so many levels of high metaphors, but he's given us examples in life which is all intrinsically written in the Kitab and the Sunnah of Yahweh. He goes on to say, O you who read, O you who read my warning against indulging in the lawful, though I betrayed myself in my actions, I sincerely advise my brethren in the words, and I say, beware of opting for concession in the matter whose danger and harm cannot be guaranteed to be saved from. This is because the devil, the shaitan, beautifies the permissible at the first stage. Then afterwards, he drugs people. He drags people to sins. Therefore, take heed of the consequences of your actions. Understand well your condition and your circumstances. So let's full stop here. I know Muslim kids. Oh, I'm just doing a little bit of marijuana. It's just a little bit. It's okay. A little bit of marijuana went to cocaine, that cocaine, it went to heroin, that heroin went to fentanyl, that fentanyl went to a life sentence in the grave. They died because they took fentanyl, which you know if you take it in the wrong dosages, you die. So a little small, little puff, and that's what the devil wants to do, just place a little bit, a little bit of seeds so you can take the seeds to follow you down the wrong path. The Prophet he laid us the seeds that would take us to the good path. 
So you can get with this, or you can get with that, as we used to say. There's the awliya of Allah, and there's the awliya of Rahman, and the awliya of the shaitan. There are the, there are the friends of Allah, and there's the friends of the devil. You have to pick for yourself. This is the test. The shaykh goes on to say, Though the shaitan may convenience you of proceeding with a matter by deceiving you, by showing you good purpose of it. And you should know that the, that the road he is leading you down will make you fall into sin. Therefore, it is enough to learn from your father Adam, who was deceived by the devil, shaitan, when he suggested to him, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim, Hal adu laka ala shajratin wa khuldi wal mulkin and I can't see La, I can't see. La yabla. I think it's la, 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 la yabla. O Adam, shall I direct you to the tree of eternity? Possession that will not, never deteriorate. Should I tell you something better than this? Jenna, this is a tree, man. If you get to this tree, you're going to get all kinds of things, man. Should I direct you? So he's directing him. And unfortunately, our father, he fell. But we fall how many times? And Allah gave him some words. And he repented after being sent, leaving the Jannah, coming down here to the earth, Ya Akhwan. So know, Ya Akhwan, that there's someone out there trying to deceive us. It could be even your friends. It could be yourself. It could be anyone, Ya Akhwan. Mashaq goes on to say, Adam then noticed nothing but the promised achievement, which was immortality. Immortality, that's what he was being promised. If you go to this tree, you'll live forever. If you eat from that fruit, you'll live forever. But he took the wrong way. This is indeed one of the most deceptive traps of the devil, the shaitan, through which he tricks the scholars. He entices them to hope for good consequences while they end up hastening the harm of risky matters. For instance, the shaitan may whisper to a scholar, you should visit the oppressor, so that you may intercede for the oppressed. The shaykh goes on to say, the scholar thus rushes to observe and investigate the wrongdoing of the oppressed, and through such exposure, his religious commitment is shaken. That means his deen gets sold out. Worse still, he may fall into an act of dis disobedience, kufr, by which he becomes more of an oppressor than the oppressor himself. Therefore, whoever does not trust his religious commitments and is not confident of his piety and his firmness should beware of the trappings. They call it a booby trap, or they call it a, a sugar trap or a honey trap, because they are concealed and unnoticed and other types of traps, Sheikh Wan. The Sheikh goes on to say that the safest yard for the concern for his religion is solitude particularly in times when goodness is dead or diminished and wrongdoing is alive. Let me stop here for a second. Since the time I was young, I had a lot of books that I read and it was always this concept and I understand it and you understand it more than it was in those books that I read 20 years ago. The concept of Luzumul Buyut, Luzumul Buyut, Luzumul Buyut, Luzumul Buyut. Luzumul buyut. This is what the scholars, they kept writing. And we look at, uh, what does the scholars mean? Stay in your home, stay in your home, stay in your home, stay in your home. When the fitna hits, stay in your home. Some of them even said, just like when you put your carpet down, your carpet's going to be there for a long time, remain in your houses. Now we kind of have an inkling with this COVID, what it means to stay in your home. That there's a fitna. And in other countries, they're going through war and all kinds of things. Typhoons, hurricanes, tsunamis, lazum and buyut. Safety is in staying at home. So we see Yahweh, the Sheikh, he goes on to say, Indeed, how affluent am I when you made me in need of you? Indeed, how affallable I am when you disheartened me from being with others. So he found more happiness in being in seclusion, worshiping Allah, than in hanging out with the people. It's a very high level of taqwa, Yahweh. The Sheikh goes on to say, okay, hold on, I, go, I, I skipped the page here. He goes on to say, uh, I went back to the last page, he goes on to say, uh, Adam then noticed nothing but the promised achievement, which was immortality, but he took the wrong way. This is indeed one of the most deceptive traps of the shaitan. I read that already. 
Next page. So the Sheikh goes on to say, uh, people of knowledge have no influence over those in authority. Very little. In the case of the latter, if a scholar interacts with them, he will expose himself to unlawful and also be incapable of pulling them out of their sins. Unless Allah has really blessed that person. Needless to mention, the Sheikh says, when a person contemplates the condition of the scholars who assume positions under the authority, will notice how they are completely detached from benefit of knowledge, thus becoming just like the police officers. Therefore, solitude and avoiding all invalidate the corrupt interpretations and the assumptions about socializing and the other way to save oneself. That being the case, should I benefit myself alone in indeed I benefit myself alone in indeed way much better than benefiting others while blame or harming myself. Beware, the Sheikh says, beware, beware of the deceptive interpretations, corrupted issues, verdicts, fatawa, endure what solitude necessitates because when you are alone in the company of your Lord, he will open for you the grace of his knowledge, hence all the difficulties will be eased. All bitters, all bitterness will be enjoyable, all hardship will be relieved, and all goals will be achieved. Indeed, Allah directs people to success by His grace, as there is no power or will except with Allah. So a side point here. There's many books written about Luzum al-Buyut, there's many books written about Khumul, which is remaining alone, not mixing, not interacting, and there's a time and there's a place for it, and the Sheikh is saying that you know, he got a chance to give some lectures and it benefited some people. And because it benefited some people, you know, people said, okay, he's got the gift of gab. Come and talk, come and hang out with us. Come and eat a steak, come spend some time. Come and eat some shrimp, come let's wine and dine. Come and hang out. There's a cost to this, brothers. There's a cost to this. So I remember one time, and this is not to make fun of anybody. One brother came to me and he said, Achi, brother so-and-so. And I'm not, I didn't live in that city. He said, brother so-and-so. He's trying to get this and such and such a government position. I said, oh, okay, well, mashallah. He goes, don't you want to vote? I said, well, first of all, I don't live in this area, so I can't vote for him. But he said, aren't you impressed? He came all the way from such and such and such a country, and he came over here, and he's trying to get into the government, and he wants to do this. I said, okay, well, that's between him and Allah. I'm not judging him. But brother, this is such a great thing. And I said to the brother, I said, Akhi, listen, if I wanted to do what he's doing, I would have did it long before him. I got more connections. I got more family here. I'm not an immigrant, English is my first language. I started to give him a whole plethora of stuff. I said, if that's where my goal was, I would have did it. But Allah didn't give me that path. Allah gave me a different path. If he wants to do that, that's good for him. You know, as they say, you know, um, whatever floats your boat. If that's what you want to do, okay. As for me, I'm over here, I'm doing this thing. Aren't you impressed? I said, no. He goes, well, what impresses you? And I said, well, to be honest with you, what impresses me is a convert who learned Islam, and I'm talking about a good friend of mine, and he memorized some Quran, and he gives Jummah khutbas, and he happens to be blind, and he travels all over the world. If he wanted that position of that same guy who came from the Muslim country over here, he could have got that position too. That's what impresses me. The Muslims that were born in Islam, some of them are going this way, and the converts are going like this, Yahwa. We have to be careful, brothers. As the Sheikh is saying that that opportunity came to him where he can whine and dine. And he can hang out with this guy and hang out with that guy. He could live the good life. He had the skills. He had the eloquence. He had all those things. But he felt that if he continues to do that, his heart would become away from Allah. He would become away from worship. He would become away from goodness. And he felt it had a tremendous effect upon his heart, Ya Akhwan. So when you read these books, Ya Akhwan, these books of Zuhud, these books of Tazkiyat nafs these books of insights, ethics, thought-provoking gems, wisdoms. You find, Ya Akhwan, that the scholars, they did their job. فَاسْأَلُوا أَهْلِ ذِكْرِ إِن كُنْتُمْ لَا تَعْلَمُونَ Ask the people of knowledge if you don't know. They left for us hundreds of books. There's behind me, there's hundreds of books here. Volumes, tafsir, tariq, history. Books of sharh, uh, shurahat. They have here all kinds of books, Ya Akhwan. But who has the time to read a little bit, and to practice a little bit, to learn a little bit, to love a little bit, to live a little bit? Who has 
the issue that I wanted to discuss today, but we're out of time. In the Qayyim, he wrote another very beautiful book. It's called Miftah Adar Sa'ada. It is called The Keys to Happiness, Ya Akhwan. The Keys to Happiness. This is something that these scholars, they were looking for contentment of the heart, and they're looking for the keys to happiness, Ya Akhwan. What is your key to happiness? What is my key to happiness? We should be trying to please Allah. We should want the Ridwan of Allah. We want to, the Ridha of Allah Azza wa Jal. When we die, do we know if our Lord is happy with us? This is the last question, because lessons or blessings is the beginning of our topic, and we're going to end with this. I've met hundreds of Muslims, and when I ask them this question, Sheikh, do you love Allah? You love Allah? Do you love Allah, Sheikh? Do you love Allah? Do you love Allah? That sounds good, but the question, the answer is, does Allah love us? This is it's important for us to love Allah. But we need to think on the other side of the coin. Does Allah truly love us? And what does it take for Allah to love us? So when you get these books, you'll see the sheikhs are giving out all these formulas, brothers and sisters, the keys to happiness, the captured thoughts. I'm encouraging the brothers and sisters with your Quranic reading and your Hadith reading, read some of these other books because it gives you great insight to how people thought. Their thought and process is not much different than us. It's more advanced than us. But they wanted good in this life and good in the hereafter. And that's what we have to ask Allah with Jal. Brothers and sisters, lessons can become blessings. And you could be a winner if you're a sinner, if you make tawbah. We only have a few days left of Ramadan. If you have not made tawbah, if you've not made istighfar, we encourage you brothers and sisters, there's still some time. The fight ain't over yet. Still some time to make tawbah to Allah and to ask Allah to forgive me and to forgive you. To guide me and to guide you. To show me the light and to show you the light. To protect all the Muslims and help all the Muslims throughout the whole world. We ask Allah to help our brothers and sisters that are suffering in Palestine, suffering in China, and every other place that if we were to spend from today to tomorrow, we can mention different places. I know Muslims that are suffering in Gambia and in Ghana. And I know Muslims down in Cuba. And I know Muslims in Haiti. I know Muslims suffering everywhere. But, Ya Akhwan, we have to pray for all of our brothers, not just brothers in this country, that can, all the Muslimi, all the Muslimun. And if we do that, Ya Akhwan, I think, inshallah ta'ala, we'll be successful. As the Prophet said, إِنَّمَا الْمُؤْمِنُونَ إِخْوَى or a Muslim, a Muslim. The believer is the believer, or the brother of another brother. Inshallah ta'ala. I love you all for Allah's sake. Please keep me in your dua. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.